Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Vol West of Station 9. If you've watched the show in the last few years, you know I've been a big fan of Station 9 ever since my knuckle duster phase uh, back a few years. Station 9 specializes in making unconventional weapons and tools for combatives and survival in austere and occupied zones, drawing design inspiration from the weapons used by resistance and espionage organizations in the early 20th century conflicts. We'll find out how Volwes got interested in this subject and how he carved a niche in the knife world with it. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so by heading on over to the Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to scan the QR code on your screen or to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. Vol West, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, it is my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, actually, uh, uh, I have a lot of things to, to ask you, but it just occurred to me to ask you this. Station 9, let's start with your name. Where does that come from? So Station 9 comes from SOE, basically World War II uh, British uh, guys that did a lot of things in Europe during World War II, mostly behind enemy lines. And they had many, um, many schools where they did many things, either um, development of gear, development of uh, weapons, so on and so forth. Of course, training, physical training, psychological training. Um, They had a pretty extensive fake document department, uh, closed department, so on and so forth for sending SOE agents on the other side of the uh, the line. And so Station 9 was one of those schools. And um, it's a pretty famous one just because they did all the development of weapons and, and weird things. Yeah. Uh, well, I love it. Uh, I, I want to tell you how I first got interested in Station 9. It was, it was through this, the lapel yeah. dagger that yeah. you make. What is this, the number two? That is the number four, actually. The number okay. Yeah. All all of the all of the uh, station nine products have a a, a number, number and yeah. a name. Some of them have names, which is very cool. But uh, this yeah. right here, um, uh, when I saw this, I had to get it because um, I had seen a bunch of these little uh, SOE and OSS lapel daggers that get got sewn into clothing uh, yep. by spies and uh, resistance people. Uh, uh, all during World War II and and around that time. But uh, my brother and I had a book full of weapons, and we always uh, kind of poured over the spy weapons. And I always thought these were really cool. So what was your inspiration for uh, making these kind of things? How did you get into the making part? Well, it's it's kind of a long and complicated story. We um, First of all, there's two of us, but one of us doesn't speak English, <laughs> so he's not here tonight. Um, but there's two of us and the both of us have known each other for many, many years. And we are both really aficionados and, and really kind of like gear buffs, um, and nerds when it comes to world war one, world war two stuff, obviously we're French. So it happened on our soil. Um, but so we've always been interested in, in that kind of, um, world. And then the SOE has such a big role to play in the weapon development side of it and, and the cutting edge side of, you know, knife fighting with Fairburn and, and all those guys that it is hard when you're kind of into knives to not be into that world and kind of read as much as you can about it and why did they do certain things and, you know, all the concepts that go with it, like the, the lapel is a massive concept. Um, And so that's really what 
interested us in the first place. It's not necessarily the weapons themselves, but it's what everything that goes around it and the concept that goes with it. Um, I feel like today a lot of knife makers just make knives, which is great. But like we said, we are concept oriented. Uh, and so the concept of the lapel dagger um, and the fact that those guys would go behind enemy lines and put this little tiny weapon uh, usually into their pepper pockets. And when a German would ask for their peppers, they would be able to pull out their passport or their peppers with the lapel and maybe slash the hand of that soldier, maybe to the face and give them an opportunity to escape. So those are major concepts. And it's it was very difficult for us to not make very specific tools. So there's um, there's really a trilogy of those SOE tools. There's a lapel. And of course, there's the our number one tire slasher. We started with this guy. And this guy was uh, issued to the same agents to basically go behind enemy line and um, puncture tires. So anytime they would see a, a German vehicle, they would puncture the tires. So those are called tire slashers. And it was very hard for us to go into that environment and build our company, especially since our name is Station 9, and not start with those guys, with that SOE spirit, that British World War II fighting spirit, um, weird SOE agent behind enemy line stuff. So those are two of the really big, there's a big four with the SOE, the lapel, the tire slasher, there's the SOE coin, which we are developing. So right now I have the prototype. You guys will be the first ones to see it because we've never shown it. But so this will be our SOE, SOE coin. And the same thing, they had this in their pocket in the middle of their change inside the pocket. Um, very, uh, very devastating little, little so, tool. Uh, for people listening, describe the SOE coin. First of all, SOE was special operations executive, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Kind of like a precursor to the CIA or the OSS, something kind of like, or the exactly. MI5 in, in Great exactly. Britain. Yeah. Uh, but, but tell us about this coin. Well, the coin was one of those two that was issued. Uh, usually those guys were issued like I said, there's many tools in the toolbox, but usually when it comes to spy work and behind any enemy line work, we had the lapel dagger, which was either kept with the passport or the papers or if sewn in a pocket somewhere. Uh, and that was very a very small and effective tool um, to buy them time. There was the tire slasher, which was a sabotage tool, even though we can easily fight with it. Uh, but that was a sabotage tool. There was the coin, and the coin was kept, same thing, in their, in their pockets in the middle of other coins, so they could basically disappear inside the pockets. Um, and uh, same thing, that was uh, a last chance, last, last ditch effort slashing tool to the face. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. if you're just listening, the coin it yeah, looks like a coin from one side, but on the other side, yeah. it has a small, uh, swiveling hawkbill blade of the same circumference as the coin itself. So you can't see it from the one side. You can Correct. drop it in your pocket full of coins and kind of lose yeah. it in there, uh, exactly, and find it yeah. when you need it. Uh, yeah. something and I we thought, are. Oh, I'm sorry. No, uh, we are the um, we are the first one to do actually that that hawkbill really really extremely aggressive design usually those uh, those blades were flat so mm -hmm. they were usually flat and you know uh with a cheese of grind on it but we went with the the hog bill yeah that that gets in it's uh it's it's you're gonna have to pull it oh, tear it out to get it out. um yeah. something i thought was cool as i was perusing your um uh, website uh, on the page for uh, the number four, the SOE lapel dagger. Um, mm. You have shots of a book that appears to be a manual, an SOE manual, and it show it it discusses how to use this. And it says specifically target the eyes, the face, and the neck. Uh, it is so small. Uh, you go to the body, you're not gonna 
you're not going to really, I mean, you're going to hurt someone badly, but uh, you're not going to penetrate all the way to, to vitals with this little thing. But to the face, the eyes, the neck, uh, you could do a lot of damage. Um, so I think that uh, it's interesting about this, uh, the little tire slasher and the coin is that the tactic is at least half as important as the tool itself. Oh, yeah. And that's why that's why we enter the world of concepts. That's why we are kind of like, you know, those guys really thought about, OK, what can we hide on our persons uh, easily? What can, you know, uh, be used as effectively as possible, but at the same time be easy to carry? Uh, and uh, yeah, they came up with those very crude weapons, very small and crude weapons, but that you know um, that are so so SOE and so World War II. Um, like I said, those are iconic iconic weapons now for us. Now in 2024, when we look at the the history of of the knife world and the fighting world, the combatives world, it, it is impossible to like you know, step over that, that very short period of time with those very iconic tools. Uh, before we get to the rest of the knives in the, in the uh, station nine um, catalog, and, and you've got some really impressive, uh, well, cool designs that we've seen do impressive stuff in videos online. Before we get to that, uh, something that I think is really in the spirit of the SOE uh, dagger, the coin, and the tire slasher are the G10 chopsticks. They're they're you know they're uh, totally unexpected and um, well. Tell us about those. Well, I think that the actually the the G10 chopsticks uh, are for us for us they are kind of like you know in the same vein of that SOE special agent. Uh, type weapon, which we have a weapon that's extremely easy to carry with us, um, that is not suspect. Uh, they are just uh, chopsticks. Uh, we can take them with us on the plane. We can take them uh, everywhere. Uh, but it's a solid chunk of um, of G10, and yeah, we we have we put some tests, uh, especially on Instagram. But uh, same thing, a devastating tool. And we kind of want it to be in that, uh, stay in that vein of discreet. And so we made the, the silliest packaging possible, like that it goes everywhere. Um, it doesn't raise suspicion. But yeah, this is this has become one of our best sellers just because it's, it's such a cool product. Uh, and we wanted to just make it as silly and corny as possible. Uh, but at the same time, have a devastating tool and um, in that same vein, there's two of them. So if we are with a buddy in a plane or something, there, there's two weapons here, which is, yeah. you know, which is often, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. So uh, tell us about G10 and how it tests. I mean, um, I've seen a lot of G10 knives, undetectable knives, uh, things that people um, market for you know, getting into non-permissive environments, but uh, I I have never actually tested out G10. How does it work, especially in that sort of long, slender format? It's actually incredible. Um, we use G10 a lot on on other uh, parts of knives, for example, for the handles, just because, and that's what we've um, we've determined. G10 is great because it's extremely stable. So we can go, uh, my partner loves going into the jungle. I live in Montana. So we, we always joke that we do minus 40, uh, plus 40 centigrade here. But G10 won't move in those environments. It can be wet, it can be dry, it can be extremely cold, extremely hot. And it's a very stable platform. It's also extremely hard. Um, and if you do get, I don't know if you have Shanghai sticks, but... Uh, it's actually pretty impressive how heavy they are and how dense G10 is. And um, I was actually surprised myself. We have another G10 tool in the line, which is our G10 push. And we've done um, crazy tests with those, those tools. And 
it, they perform so well, it's actually pretty impressive. So I've, I've always been impressed with G10 and the performance level of those tools. What, what kind of tests have you done on them? Uh, metal, jeans, uh, any, anything goes, uh, but mostly, mostly metal by, you know, very negative temperatures <laughs> in Montana, uh, which is usually uh, extremely hard on, on gear. But um, yeah, I mean, they, they perform extremely well. Like I said, we have a lot of videos on our YouTube channel and uh, also on Instagram where we show the the capacity of those of those tools and the penetration. I mean, it's it's pretty remarkable. Well, it's funny. Uh, I, I love your test videos, um, especially considering uh, I don't have much of a chance to go out and and do the testing myself, or maybe it's more like I'd rather know that the knife can do it, but not do it to my own knife. Sure, of course. <laughs> if you That's will, I'm a collector. <laughs> uh, um, but so uh, Jim is scrolling through your catalog here. Um, but let, let's uh, let's talk about some of the specifics here. Uh, I'm holding in my hand the Partisan. And something that's yeah. very interesting to me about this knife, it's about a six and a half, seven inch uh, blade. It's got this really nice, uh, somewhat neutral um, micarta handle. It's yeah. a great knife. And we look at it and it looks, it resembles uh, a French chef's knife or a French fighting knife. A lot of them, yeah. a, a lot of similarities between those two especially the blade being wide enough to be the guard itself. Correct. Yeah. Um, I, I'm fascinated by this knife because of um, kind of the historical inspiration. Tell us about this. Well, um, the Partisan came out of, this is our World War I line. So we have the World War II line, and we also have the World War I line. Right now in that World War I line, we have the Partisan and we have the Knuckles which were Austro-Hungarian uh, issue to the, to the soldiers during World War I. Um, but the, the partisan, what's interesting with this knife is that during World War I, uh, French soldiers went, went into it. And at the time, we were still transitioning between very long bayonets uh, and field duty knives and soldiers in the trenches uh, remember, we went into that war. We thought it was going to last six months and be over. Um, but French soldiers started realizing that we were in a very close quarter uh, war, trenches. It was extremely cold. Uh, and I'm sure we've all seen photos of French and German soldiers during World War I in the mud with extremely thick clothing. Most of them had sheep uh, sheep. Uh, entire sheep pelts on them with very thick wool coats. And uh, everybody realized that in the trenches when it's cold like this, uh, so we are far, far away from 2024 with electric bicycles and knives that are this small for fighting in the streets. Uh, but um, we, were lacking, we were lacking a knife and soldiers didn't have knives. And so they started going to the butchers in the small villages and grabbing butcher knives, which was perfect for them because it offered a very natural knife that everybody knew and had at home. And it offered a guard, which is uh, for us, at least in, in our world, in our Station 9 world, is absolutely um, necessary for battle. And it offered a really long blade, really thin blade that was able to go through uh, heavy duty materials like wool and sheepskin and so on and so forth. So they started grabbing those those butcher knives and a lot of French soldiers went to war and killed Germans with butcher knives. Um, and so this is our homage to them, to those soldiers. This is our homage to those types of knives. Of course, ours is a, is a little bit thicker. It's got a false edge on it. Uh, we modernized it a little bit. Um, but it is the essence of that knife. The essence of that knife is a perfect World War I trench fighting knife, uh, soldier's knife. Uh, you went with 1095 uh, on this yeah. knife, um, one of my favorite steels. What, what do you find the benefit uh, for a, a knife like this? Well, first of all, 1095 has been around many, many years. Um, we have to understand that in the knife world, 
the um, uh, metallurgy side of it um, really exploded this past 10 years uh, with amazing steels that are doing amazing things. Uh, but we have a history, a very long history of, of hundreds of years where we used very specific steels for very specific reasons. Um, one of those steels, at least for this past 50 years, has been the 1095 carbon steel. And what's very interesting for us here is that it's uh, very flexible. So it's able to flex and not, um, and not uh, break like D2, for example. A blade like this in D2 would be absolutely impossible just because it would break too easily. Um, so we are, again, big um, proponent of rusticity at Station 9. So we like rustic things. We like things that we can use. Uh, we like things that can be sharpened in the field extremely easily. And for all those types of blades, which are survival blades or combative blades, soldier blades, uh, we stick with 1095 because one, everybody knows how to make a really good heat treatment on 1095 by now because we have years and decades of experience, uh, which is what matters the most. I'd rather personally buy a, a knife in 440, for example, uh, a very crappy steel to modern standards, you know, um, but at least I know that for the past 50 years, you have factories uh, that have made uh, heat treatment on that steel that know exactly how to make a really good heat treatment on that steel. And it's the same with 1095. 1095 is a classic, classic steel. Uh, it holds the world record for cutting. Um, so, I mean, easy to sharpen on the field for soldiers. Let's remember that this is for us a soldier's knife, a soldier's blade. So I can be in the trenches, grab a a rock, grab a, a, a mug, a ceramic mug, and I should be able to sharpen my knife. Very easy to maintain, uh, cuts like crazy, and uh, and will we'll bend under certain forces uh, and not break. And it's what we want with a, a soldier's blade, a utility yeah. blade. Yeah, it seems like a natural fit for a combat blade. Um, yes. I mean, you know, K-bars, which are, which are um legendary also use uh, yep. 1095 all yep. the tops knives and all the outdoors knives uh worth their salt are 1095 or, or something also tough you know there's a you know 3v is a kind of a, a a luxury steel in that sort of category but 1095 is um like you said like tried and true it is proven um and to me it makes the most sense on something like this which uh, is also tipping its hat towards uh, history. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's a long blade, so you you yeah. want that you want a mild steel. You want a steel that will be able to move. You know, um, that's super important. If we were on something smaller, and we have smaller smaller tools with us, but on on smaller things, then we can we can try things and go to different steels. But again, this is World War One mud, um, <laughs> trench yeah. coats, and uh, you know that's that's what it is. That's the that's really the soul of that knife. Uh, something about this knife that also is interesting to me uh, conceptually is the fact. Well, you know, it's based on the the history of people grabbing what they could grab, and what makes the more the most sense for trench fighting something that's already optimized for cutting meat and yeah. um you know that's what you're doing when you're fighting hand to hand you're cutting meat and to yeah. me that um putting that all together it makes this knife uh, all the more interesting uh to me because it's it's not a pretty picture it paints but it's realistic what are you going to go for you're going to go for something that's already um used for that purpose yeah like, like we always say, if you jump back to World War I, we put you in a trench, we give you, you know, um, a big heavy coat, you're in the mud, and you, we're going to tell you, hey, you're going to fight hand-to-hand -hand with another guy. Uh, what, what do you want? You know, do you want, <laughs> do you yeah. want this? Do you want that? Um, yeah, I'll take, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take, well, I'll take that. 
speaking of that, I mean, this, uh, so these are the, your, your knuckles, uh, yeah. and they're based on, uh, the knuckles issued to Austro Hungarian soldiers during world war one. And to me, um, you know, uh, well, first of all, as someone who didn't serve and was never issued any weapon, it's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a whole different world to me. But the fact that people at one point were issued something as, uh, close and personal and just, um, uh, devastating as knuckles like this yeah. is very interesting. There's no palm swell. There's no, uh, we're used to seeing certain kind of knuckles that come down here. And, uh, um, tell, tell me about this design and, uh, how you chose this and why you chose to go knucks, uh, knuckles at all. Well, so, um, back to world war one, uh, Austro Hungarians were issued this. And, um, first of all, it's a very clean, simple design. It's extremely violent, uh, which we love, <laughs> and um, it has no palm swell. So um, when they were issued this, you have to remember that at that time they have to service. They had to service their weapons. Um, they had to work their weapons um, constantly, and so they were issued those because they could wear those knuckles in the trenches and still manipulate their gun, load their guns fire their guns, but if somebody came over the wall and fell into their trenches, they could also just right away fight them with a tool in their hand. So that's why those uh, were made that way. Um, and again, again, with Station 9, we just were into concepts. And that concept of being able to have knuckles, but at the same time grab somebody by their coat, mm -hmm. uh, headbutt them, um, manipulate a weapon, grab a knife, uh, do all those things was extremely appealing to us and very interesting, not only historically speaking, but uh, also in terms of combat and combatives on the ground. We modernized them because um, we made them out of aluminum, so they are extremely lightweight, uh, very easy to carry in the pocket, uh, but it's a devastating tool um absolutely uh absolutely violent uh but uh, extremely interesting in the sense that in in if we transpose it to our modern day i can still grab somebody i can still open the door i can still open a car door i can still uh, grab my phone um i can do a lot of things with them that we cannot do with regular more traditional knuckles so that's why we went with those. And again, they fall into our World War I uh, territory with the, with the partisans. So those two things go together. Uh, and we have a, a third that will complete this set of this World War I set coming hopefully uh, this year. Oh, can you give us a hint or is that uh, still to be determined? I can't, I can't give you a hint, uh, but... Um, it's going to be pretty wild because I think it's going to shake up again a little bit the, the belief system around certain tools. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, you know, I'm, we'll, I will gladly come back on your podcast and talk about it. But yeah. Cool. I, I already have some ideas. We'll see if I was right. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. Before we, before we move on from the knuckles, um, uh, something that I, I used to think was um, very necessary with, knuckles is weight the weight of brass for instance uh you pick up brass knuckles and and uh, a, a huge component of what you're getting out of that is additional force from the weight these it seems like what you're getting out of uh is is additional speed uh you you've got these these terrible spikes on there and uh and you can go fast with these and recover quickly with them um, I, uh, I've hit them with my Bob dummy. I had to wrap, um, as I was showing you before, I had to wrap a little, uh, uh, paracord in there just to make it, uh, easier for my hands to fit, but, uh, they really stay stable in the hand. Um, what, uh, what, if any thought went into the trade-off of weight? So the trade-off of weight, uh, is again, how we're going to use the knuckles. Most people have in their mind that we use knuckles like if we were boxing. Um, for us, we come from the combative schools 
and so forth. It's going to be angle one, angle two. It's going to be hammer fists. Mm -hmm. And when we use knuckles with hammer fist, we actually don't need that weight. Uh, this is going to be devastating in the face. I mean, we can we can imagine. But if I go hammer fist, um, it, it's going to be absolutely devastating. And therefore, I don't need that weight. Same thing. Uh, if we are on the clinch or something and I can hit the ribs with this or just even rub the ribs, it's going to be extremely painful. So I think there's a little bit of myth with knuckles in how we use them, what they are for. Uh, most of the time, the knuckles are, are so devastating that we actually don't need to traditionally box with them. Uh, I can just do little jabs with them. But for us, um, in our school of thought, uh, we go full on combatives with them, and therefore it's all hammer fists, angle one, angle two, um, and yeah, there's no no need for weight here. Huh? That's uh, uh, to me, angle one and angle two, and that kind of raking motion is uh, is what I end up doing with these, um, and and all knuckles. I have a, I have another pair of knuckles that are a little bit more traditional with the palm swell, and uh, they still. Uh, are not as comfortable to me in anything but that hammer fist and that sort of raking motion. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, um, well, that's, that's cool to hear. But um, so you're talking about combatives and how you come from uh, less of the, uh, your instinct with these is to do something more like Filipino Kali or whatever, uh, whatever art uses a knife. Um, uh, as opposed to say boxing. So combatives go into your designs. Um, and it seems like outdoor survival and, uh, well, uh, survival in austere environments, as your mission statement says, uh, is a big part of it. Tell me about, uh, uh, your, your combatives and your outdoors experience and how those come together with you and your partner, uh, to create these, um, these cool products. Well, I mean, the um, uh, and to, to, to just uh, go back just a few seconds on this, because mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Cali, for example, we do not come from the Cali school. We come from trenches and, and World War I, too. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, that, that actually that hammer fist is prevalent in, in those uh, in those uh, concepts and, and, mm. and sets of combatives. Um, the, everything else, so basically after, after those World War I, World War II sets, we have our urban line and our outdoors line, if we can call it that. But yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, we, um, we've worked intensively uh, with the military and we, uh, my partner and I really wanted to put out um, a soldier's knife. Uh, we felt that even though they are a really good soldier's knives on the market, uh, we felt that something a little bit um, more rustic was needed. And so we came up with the number eight. I don't know if you have a number eight, but the seer. Uh, the seer, yeah. Yes. Uh, so that really is the start of our of our outdoor survival, you know, um, concept. And the seer, it's the same thing. The seer came out of uh, for us a need for for a military knife. Uh, and by now, we just signed our first contract with uh, French special forces. Ah, oh, cool. So they are, you know. They bought it. <laughs> Congratulations. That's a <laughs> real you. feather in your cap. Yeah. Um, but so we really wanted um, to go back to the roots with the soldier's knives. Uh, Bowie, uh, very simple, 1095, five inch and a quarter, double guard. Uh, we, again, emphasize a lot on the need for guards. It's amazing the amount of fighting knives on the market today without a guard. <laughs> Um, but we wanted the double guard and we made it, of course, uh, kind of modern and not as pronounced as some other double guards. And again, this very simple, simplistic, rustic um, handle, G10, 
so very, very rustic, very usable. Uh, like I said, 1095 G10 handle. So, you know, uh, a very, very strong knife. It's not too big. It's not too small. It's not too heavy. It's not too light. Um, it kind of fits that that perfect spot for us. Um, so, yeah, we are extremely happy with it. Um, it's definitely my favorite knife in our <laughs> in our collection. Yeah. But, you know. Um, well, yeah. uh, let me um, let me please give you some observations I have about this knife. Go for um, it. A uh, couple of couple of things. I got these on the same day, and yeah. I did a totally non scientific uh, thrusting test against the the box it came in, uh, without any weight in it. And this was an amazing penetrator. This uh, this and maybe it's that swedge, maybe it's the tip and yeah. and how it's all set up. But this yeah. so effort effortless effortlessly penetrated very deeply uh with very little effort so that that impressed me and surprised me right mm -hmm. off the bat a couple of other interesting uh design things i found is that though you definitely um added the double guard uh yeah. with the top guard smaller so you can use the thumb on the back of the blade and all that you still maintain some of this uh french design um even if you didn't have that guard there uh the width of the blade against that handle would yep. still act as a guard which is something yep. that we see very traditionally kind of in this knife here correct um and then the um the long swedge starting from all the way near the ricasso and come coming all the way down um yep. is a very effective for those thrusts i was talking about and b um to me is kind of a tip of the hat to that mac v sog design with that super long swedge and uh good for you this, yeah, this thing hits on all cylinders for me. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, the the long swedge uh, is actually a throwback, so we are huge Vietnam War <laughs> buffs too. But um, yeah, it's a it's a throwback to a more um, traditional eighties, seventies, eighties, you know, uh, type design. Um, and yeah, it's definitely. We did have, you know, the the sub Bowie in mind. Uh, of course, all the Randalls, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the the fifteen, uh, the Randall number fifteen. Um, but yeah, so it's it's um, it's the child of all those, you know, kind of combat knives. Um, and like we said, we you know we really wanted to have a, a soldier's knife that they could use and get out of, you know certain choices that for us even though they are great knives like we see a lot of soldiers today wearing s's and s's mm -hmm. are great bushcraft knives they are great outdoors knives i love s's i have i have a few um but to us we we really wanted something with a double guard extremely important for soldiers um and that's that's really the the soul of this knife and of course uh, the Bowie makes it uh, for for everything that's thrusting, uh, yeah. devastating. Yeah, yeah. In a in a pinch, if a soldier needs a knife like this, in a in a uh, from what I've heard from stories told to me, uh, it's all about being able to thrust through layers of of clothing and and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And and this. This is perfect for that. Uh, this yeah. knife to me seems like a great uh, go to war sort of knife. And uh, like I said before, I haven't gone to war, but I've talked to a lot of people who have. And and we know a lot of the most popular uh, designs for combat knives are not big, giant things like you see in the movies. Uh, they're manageable five and a half inch uh, Bowie style blades with with great handles. And I think well, this fits yeah. the bill. Especially nowadays, I mean, those guys carry so much gear. Yeah, yeah. Um, we see it. You know, we were we were training with uh, special forces last week, and those guys carry so much gear, have so much weight on, and that's another thing. You know, there's a lot of things in combatives where, you know, you you were talking about Cali and stuff like that. Uh, when you are wearing uh, plates, when you are wearing, you know, um, magazines on your chest and everything. Angle one on the chest is, you know, useless, pointless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we do go back to more traditional combative theories um, and concepts. 
but um, that is also why we wanted something that was not overly built, that was not too heavy, because those guys, like we said, carry so much so much weight already um, yeah. in gear. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is uh, this uh, knocks a venerable knife out of the water for me, uh, which is the Sog Seal Pup, and I love that thing, and I carry it in my backpack. Um, and well, that's- the- the handle, the handle won't burn on that one. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's in my backpack in case I lose the backpack. I, that's why I right. wouldn't carry this all the time. Because, <laughs> uh, but um, so something cool about this knife, and then um, you also have a very small uh, clip point blade that is definitely like um, it's like a neck knife. But um, mm-hmm. both that knife and this knife uh, come with not come with, but you can. Um, accessorize with sheaths that have pouches and all sorts of sort of uh, survival accoutrement. It, like to me, this is a fighting knife because uh, mm-hmm. I'm not, well, I'm not doing either, but uh, I'm not out there in the woods surviving. So I don't look at this and think survival knife immediately. Right. Um, but that's, that is what it is because it's called a sear knife. Um, so yeah. tell us about the, the, the packet, the, um, the sheaths with the extra on them. Well, and that's what we wanted to do with this knife. We wanted, you know, so right now, if you look at soldiers, you'll often have um, that sear concept ingrained in them, which is great. But I personally feel that the sear stuff went more and more bushcraft and less and less survival and resistance. Um, and so we kind of wanted to balance again, this, uh, this sear concept. And that's why I think a lot of guys end up with, um, knives that are not necessarily fighting knives, but that are, that are tools, which is great. We need a tool with the sear. We wanted a tool, but also a weapon. Mm. So we wanted to marry both, uh, tool and weapon to kind of rebalance the thing. And because it was in that sear vein, we were like, okay, well, um, we would love to also be able to attach uh, a sear kit, a survival um, evasion, resistance and escape kit to it, uh, to be able to put some some gear to go with it, to go with that cutting tool implement. So we, um, we, uh, we did those patches with the Leicester River Bushcraft, um with jason and those patches are absolutely fantastic and that's why we also designed the um kydex the way we designed it uh we designed it for soldiers that jump out of planes so we had to have a uh, really good retention mm-hmm. but also we were we wanted something where we could adapt a pouch on it a utility pouch for some gear um and because we did this on the on the sear um, the number eight, we also did it with the little one. The little one uh, is also kind of interesting because it was also, and we really didn't mean for this, but it was also picked up by the French Special Forces. Yeah, <laughs> cool. And they wanted it because they started carrying it in missions um, in, their, in their pants uh, as their real circuit. Most of the guys right now, when they carry the sear on their gear, they'll put a smoke grenade in it or they'll put a grenade, but they won't put a kit in it. Um, but this guy, they, they keep it fully kitted. So we developed a, a sear kit for them. Um, and uh, same thing, this comes with that little little pouch, which is actually Velcroed on there. So we can separate them. Those guys can use the kit or they can use the knife. And the knife, um, we wanted something extremely small, extremely lightweight. This is 42 grams, VG10. They don't have to worry about it. Uh, it won't you know, rust on them. There's no maintenance. They can keep it in their pocket. And that really becomes their cutting implement uh, for their circuit. We developed that knife, though, that knife uh, at least 15 years ago. So it took us that long to bring that knife to market. Um, 
But yeah, this this little guy, un, unbeknownst to us, same thing, got picked up, you know, by the military. Mm -hmm. And now they are using it as a as a full kit with the with the pocket and you know the the patch was always gonna go with those two knives. Uh, from the get go, we were like, okay, let's let's make a knife that can be completed if people want and carried uh, with a with a kit in it. I I love that little knife because uh, well, first of all, I like the little kit on there, and uh, you know you can imagine just the the bare essentials go in there. And yep. uh, and you can, you know, create better opportunity for yourself out there in a survival situation with those things. Uh, but also, I love that you have a little compass attached to the pommel and that, of course, uh, lengthens the handle. So you get utility in two different ways there. And you're really maximizing yep. your space and weight. Uh, yeah, with those. exactly. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, again, very small, uh, very small utility knife. Again, with this guard, because we are you know, yeah. <laughs> obsessed with guards on knives. Yeah. Um, but um, clip point, very utilitarian blade. Uh, right now, I just have a little photon in the in the oh, back yeah. of it. And, and that's how we actually give it to the military guys. But um, yeah, it's such a small, capable knife. It's actually been same thing. Pretty amazing to us what that those guys picked it up. Those guys go on mission with it. Um, and it's it's just you know cool brownie points for us, but uh, we really wanted to make something extremely lightweight. We can carry in the pocket. We can carry uh, in many ways. Obviously, we can carry it as a as a neck knife. That's how I carry it. Uh, but yeah, forty two grams VG ten. Uh, it's a it's a great little great little knife. And again, I I, I we felt that something like that was kind of missing uh, with the you know. So here it is. Yeah. Well, uh, you're talking about how uh, you and your partner um, are obsessed with guards. Everything's got to have a guard. And that's obviously uh, for retention, but also uh, so that your hand doesn't go sliding up on the on the blade and all that. Well, you teamed up with uh, the great and powerful Fred Perrin to create your scorpion knife which yep. has so much of a guard, your finger is encapsulated. Uh, tell us about that. And, and and by the way, I think he's one of the coolest dudes out there, period. Uh, I had a chance yep. to talk with him. Um, I met you also uh, briefly two and a half years ago at Blade Show, and then I talked yep. with Fred Perrin. Yeah, we Fred, right was, yeah. Fred was yeah. with us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah very Fred. cool guy. Uh, tell us about that collaboration. Well, first of all, uh, so my partner is a full-time knife maker. He's been a full-time knife maker for 20 years, and he actually apprenticed with Fred. He's the only knife maker in the world that apprenticed with Fred no for, for many years. Wow. So we've known Fred for 20 years. Um, and of course, Fred has La Griffe. Everybody should know about La Griffe now. Uh, a great, great concept with this uh, finger hole. And this is our version, but there's, I've got other, other griefs out there. Um, but really the main concept here is uh, to have a guard. Again, to be able, if somebody, if we're in a fight, somebody punches us or we hit the ground for some reason, if we have to open our hand, the knife stays in our hand, which is pretty cool. Uh, and of course, it gives us a full uh, a full guard. Um, we uh, from the get go, I think, when we started Station Nine, we've always wanted to uh, do our version of the grief. And of course, Fred was always okay with it. Um, but so we did um, a fuller length grief um, because I think that Emerson's got a grief, um, uh, Spider Co's got a grief. I think he. He gave that design to a lot of a lot of companies. CRKT's um, got one. Okay, okay. But we wanted something extremely aggressive. So now we go into our urban line. Mm. Extremely aggressive. Uh, something that's actually extremely comfortable to use, either hammer or pical. Um, and we have serrations on top. I mean, this thing. In Pical like this, it's absolutely it's a pfft, carnage. Um, so you know that's that's where this comes from. But yeah, this is our homage to Fred. 
Um, and, you know, we, we are just so proud and lucky to know him and, of course, to be able to, to do a collab with him. So we were super excited to do that. Is yeah. this uh is this like a neck knife? How how would you how do you wear that when you when you wear that? I wear that uh, static line uh, yeah. appendix. So either left side, right side doesn't matter. But I wear that static line, and no clip, no nothing. It moves with me, and I want to be able to. And that's the great thing about the static line is that I'm able when I'm carrying a number nine from us. But oh, uh, I this, love that one. The static line allows us to, when we are on the ground fighting and so on and so forth, to be able to pull the blade away from our body, uh, especially with double edge weapons like this. Mm -hmm. uh, if this is in a, a tech lock, for example, right next to my skin and I'm bent weird or I want to grab my knife while I'm fighting on the ground or bent uh, and so on and so forth, and I pull this against my skin, then you know i i might injure myself the great thing about you know the static line is that i can pull away from my body so that's how we carry this but you can carry it many many other ways um it really depends you know who you are and what you do and you know that day well i gotta say i'm really <laughs> glad i asked you that because uh i've i've carried i, I have certain knives that i carry on a static cord um, usually that has to do to size. Uh, um, but I was just thinking today because I had a double edged pickle on me today and, uh -huh. uh, I put a, on a little bit of weight during Easter. And I was thinking if I had to draw this thing while sitting, I would have to like, I would have to clear my stomach because I would yeah. cut my stomach. And, and I had never thought of that. I love, uh, discrete carry concepts clips. I love close in the waistband right. carry. Yeah. Um, but it's usually uh, for a long time I'd carry it over at the three o'clock position. But now that I carry appendix, I yeah. have to think more about how I draw it. And am I going to cut my own belly? Right. Uh, well, especially with yeah, I mean, especially with double edged blades and you know. Yeah. But yeah, the the static carry, I can I can pull my knife. I'm not against my skin. I'm not against you know uh, my own body. So that's that's really the great um the great way to use that static line uh so you have mentioned uh your partner a few times and i've been following him for years at uh, uh mr lopez uh, yeah. knife maker does amazing stuff uh, uh tell us a little bit about uh him and and uh his angle on things well he's my brother from another mother so we 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 uh we um it's actually pretty rare to have, exception, especially in this world. In this world of mixed combatives, guns, knives, um, and so on and so forth, it's pretty rare to find somebody where you actually agree on everything. Um, and that's the case with uh, Tony. We actually started uh, Station 9, Station nine before we started making weapons, we did courses. So we taught people combatives. Uh, so that's how we really started with that universe. And that's actually how we met Fred. We met Fred through combatives, not through not through knife making. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, um, that's really the key for us is, like I said before, we, we are more into concepts than than knives. Uh, we love knives, obviously. Uh, we, we are, you know, obsessed with knives. But what really tickles us is the, all those little concepts that go with it. Why why static line? What's going on there? Mm -hmm. Why tech lock? Why did everybody move to tech lock? Um, and tech lock is great when I'm in the military and I wear a uniform and I have plates on and I have to put a knife on my plate carrier. Fantastic. Um, street stuff. So it's weird because you have all those little micro universes and everybody's kind of like going from one universe to another saying, oh, in your universe, this doesn't work. In your universe, this doesn't work. Um, but there are different universes, And that's, that's the hard part with, I think, the knife world is understanding, am I holding a bushcraft knife or am I holding 
a combat knife? Am I holding, um, uh, let's go in the wood, cut mushroom knives, or am I holding a combative knife, a, a fight for my life knife? And what does that mean to that knife? How is that knife built? Why is it built that way? You know, yeah, if somebody, if I if I have to pull out that knife and I'm holding that knife and somebody headbutts me or I trip on a sidewalk or something and I fall over and my hands open because that's a human thing to do. Um, yeah, am I going to lose that knife or is that knife going to stay in my hands? All those things start becoming extremely interesting to us. Um, and so, you know, it's just like we were saying with the partisan. Um it's great to fight in the streets with, um, with in the streets of uh, San Diego with little knives when it's always a hundred degrees and everybody's t-shirt and shorts. But what happens to us in Montana when I have to fight guys that are cowboys that are wearing Levi's, you know, jean jackets and sweaters and snow hats and have beards and you know. <laughs> It's a different world. It's a completely different world. And so it's fascinating to us on how those micro worlds affect tactics and combatives and concepts. And then we go back to concepts and we're like, okay, during, yeah, World War II, if I was a guy that was pushed out of an airplane dressed in civilian and I had to, you know, spy on Germans, uh, I would have a set of tools and skills that was defined by that environment. And the concepts coming out of that are fascinating. So, you know, um, the the concept of the grief is fascinating, you know, when you start digging a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 great to have found a partner that, you know, is into the same thing and we think the same way and we have the same culture. You know, we, we both feel that we have lost a lot of that knife culture in the past 20 years. So, you know, we're just, this is our little contribution to this culture and the knife culture and the fighting culture and the street culture, the soldier culture, the bushcraft culture, um, you know, but it's all, it's all different tools. And, you know, I would never go to war with a bushcraft knife. Yeah. And I would never go carve a spoon with, uh, you know, with a battle knife, you know. Well, I, I appreciate the um, I, I appreciate the the um, the attention to the different concepts and designing within those concepts and within those realms. Uh, but what I really personally uh, appreciate is your and Station Nine's unabashed um, dedication to making weapons and to making them um, time tested, uh, especially in a time where knives are are. Uh, uh, especially out of a, a an overabundance of caution relegated to the tool. You'll hear a lot of guys say, I just review tools. These aren't weapons. Don't demonetize me. And I totally get that. And a lot of people aren't into combatives and stuff. Uh, but for those of us who are and who love the history of weapons and, uh, and, and are interested in those eras that are not that far uh, gone. Um, yeah. I appreciate what station nine is doing. Um, what uh, before I let you go? What uh, anything in the offing? Any concepts uh, that you're thinking of? You don't have to d announce future knives or anything, but any concepts uh, in the offing that you'd like to, um, as a company, uh, take uh, take on? Well, I mean, we are still working on developing our urban line. Um, I still feel that there's uh, a gap within the. Uh, combative knife world with women mm. so we are developing right now a, a, a tool that is going to be uh we feel appropriate for women uh not that they can't use any of those big knives um, but uh, there are certain realities just the way uh women dress and just the way their clothes are designed uh, there are certain realities here that we have to we have to obey by uh, so I think for us, the, the big challenges ahead, we, uh, we were asked again by the, by the special forces to develop another tool for them. Everybody wants us to um, make a shovel. We love shovels. <laughs> um, so there, there are 
plenty of great challenges uh, for us ahead. Um, but I'd say right, as of right now, um, and that's after developing the number nine, which is, you know, uh, right now kind of our flagship urban urban blade but it's gonna be it's gonna be tackling that 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 gap with with women self-defense and you know combatives great well we're gonna we're gonna talk a few more minutes uh for the patrons in an exclusive uh, little bit of uh, interview and i'm gonna ask you about that number nine which i love uh ever since i saw um, Mr. Lopez making a knife very similar to that a uh, few years back. Uh, yeah. And sometimes he put a double edge on it. Woo, beautiful. Uh, so we'll get to that. Uh, but I want to say, Vol West, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and talking with you about your uh, design philosophy and the philosophy behind Station 9. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. And, you know, uh, thank you for the opportunity to explain a little bit which we really have the platform to do, you know. Mm -hmm. People just see the the tools and the knives um, arriving on the website, but we are really given the opportunity to explain a little bit where we come from and why we do certain things, and you know. Um, so hopefully, we were able to answer some of those questions tonight. And and thank you for the opportunity. Ah, it's my pleasure. All righty, sir. Take care. Bye. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Volwest of Station 9. Uh, if you aren't familiar with them, definitely go check out their Instagram and uh, all their test videos and their, their products uh, as they come out. They make some seriously cool stuff. And as you heard, uh, really deep and interesting philosophy behind everything they do. All right. Be sure to join us uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.